<laughs> I'm the horse at the gate. Let me out, let me out, let me out. <laughs> Come. Go. Okay, it is Wednesday afternoon, July 7th. We are picking up at the end of our second book that talks about the people, the redeemed, that the first book, the, the Redeemer coming in his first coming in his suffering state to suffer for the penalty of sin and death for us. We saw that in the first book. Now we're in the second book. We're seeing who he did that for. We're about finished with that. We'll pick back up under the sign of Aries, which is the last of the four major signs that we look at in the second book. Remember, Aries is represented by the ram or the goat, which is um, a picture of a sacrificial animal. This opened also with Capricornus. Actually, Aries is the lamb or the ram. I think I just said goat. Forgive me. <laughs> My head, mine's going too fast. Aries is a sign that you see it, the ram or the lamb. The ram is a male lamb, okay? Animal is sacrifice. We all know that. We know Isaiah 53. We know that, that Yohanan John said, Behold the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sin of the world. At the start of this second book, if you go back in your mind to Capricornus, Capricorn name for today, that also was an animal of sacrifice. That had the goat. The goat had its head going down as if it was being slain, but it had a fish tail that was coming up out of the water, springing up in the newness of life. We saw the death and resurrection of the Messiah in that first one. The two books in between, or the two chapters, sorry, the two chapters in between are fishies. And we see that God fishes for men. He told his, um, the Lord told his Tamadim, I'll make you fishers of men. So the two books in the middle that deal with fish are the people that are being redeemed and then anchored on that other end. The last chapter in that second book of the redeemed people is Aries, is where we are now. It is the ram or the lamb that was sacrificed, but this time the way that it's supposed to be laying in our picture is kind of like in repose, not in the head down being slain, but as if it's been accomplished now. We also see, and this is what we'll talk about today, is the foot of the ram is on part of Cetus, part of the band. We'll talk about what that means in just a few minutes as we come back to it. Um, the band, though, remember the band was with Pisces, Pisces being the fish. We saw two fishies. We saw it could be those raptured and it could be those martyred. And we saw that it, it could be the Gentile family and the Jewish family brought one in Messiah. You know, we see both. We see spiritual seed and we see natural seed. There are many pictures that we could use. They're all fitting. So <clears throat> you can have one, two, three, or all of the above. <laughs> okay? Uh, but now we looked at the band. We looked at um, under... Um, the Pisces. We saw the woman that was chained. She was helpless. Uh, I don't have her name right in front of me. Uh, Cassiopeia is the one that's freed. Andromeda or Andromeda, however I'm supposed to pronounce that, is the one who was chained. Um, but uh, Messiah was going to set her free. We saw Cepheus, the crowned king. This was a picture of the Redeemer coming to rule, the king that would be enthroned. And in Cepheus, we were thrilled to learn that the polar star is now under his foot as if he is in control of the star that, that is representing our world. Remember when we started the study way back when, the polar star was in the sign of Draco the dragon. It was showing that Satan was the god of this world. But this moved now, and we see that we're coming into the time when the king will rule over all the earth. And we know that, that we're really right on the edge of that being reality rather than prophecy. It's coming very, very quickly now, I believe. I'll go out on that limb and I'll say that, okay? So then we moved into Aries and saw that, that this... Uh, the sacrificed animal is looking as if his work has been done. He's given his life. He's picked his life back up again. We looked at the first decon, the first minor constellation under the big one, Aries, and that is Cassiopeia, the one I just mentioned a moment ago, and that's when she's sitting there fixing her hair and her robe because the bride's getting ready for her groom. And we see that she's no longer captive, but she's delivered by the, the CPS, by the king. She's near him in the sky. 
because where does a, a bride belong but right next to her groom? And the groom is, uh, uh, you know, fulfilling, doing all and completing. Uh, so it's as if we are the bride, the the wife, the lamb's wife, we'll put it that way, okay? That's where we left off last time. We're going to pick up with Cetus. Cetus is the sea monster. It is huge. If you put your chart upside down and you look down here at the bottom on your chart, do you have, do you need, do you need all this stuff? Yeah, oh, okay, okay. Okay, that's what we're going to be talking about. It is large. I can share it with you if you need to hold on to it, if it helps you. See, this is the enemy of God. This is a sea monster. He looks uh, very angry. Good. He should look angry and he should look ugly. <laughs> okay? He is Satan in essence. He's not only the enemy of God, he is the enemy of God's people, God's earthly people, the believers. He's the enemy of God's heavenly angels and so forth also. Notice he, has, he is enormous in size. He has an enormous head. He has an enormous mouth. He has big front paws. And he's got a tail of a whale. <laughs> this is no tail, okay? The star names are going to speak to him being bound, being chained, being overthrown. So let's look at this in detail, okay? There's 97 stars that make up this sea monster. Wow. But if we know that this is talking about him being chained, then that immediately takes us to Revelation 20. You may be very familiar, but if not, you can look it up or listen. Whoops, and I will read it for you. Revelation 20, we're looking at verses 1 through 3. Revelation 19, Yeshua, the Messiah, has returned in the Battle of Armageddon, stopped that battle by the the word that comes out of his mouth, the enemy is put to a stop, it, everything is over, and uh, we move into Revelation 20, which talks to us about what follows the tribulation period, and that is the millennial, the thousand year reign of Yeshua Jesus on earth. Six times in just a few verses, we have the millennial mentioned. I think if the Lord six times says it's a thousand years, I'm going to believe him. It's a thousand years. But what about this sea monster during that time? We're saying that the stars, and I'll tell you a bit more, but we're saying that the stars are telling us that uh, he is bound, he is chained, he is overthrown. Well, let's read Revelation 20, verses 1 through 3. Then I saw an angel. Notice it is just simply an angel. This is not an archangel. This is not one who we know has, has strong power like Gabriel, mighty man of God. This is just an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key of the abyss, a great chain in his hand. He took hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan. Anybody question who this is? <laughs> I think it tells you very clearly. And bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss, that's a bottomless pit. He shut it, sealed it over him so that he would not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were completed. After these things, he must be released for a short time. Well, notice how exacting we are in our gospel in the stars. It's not saying that he's dead. It's not saying that he's gone forever, but it's saying that he is chained or he is bound. He has a bright star in his face. That's menkar in the um, original language, and it means bound or chained enemy. In his tail, he has a star that means overthrown or thrust down. Um, and also let me tell you that in scripture when you read the name Leviathan, Leviathan means a piercing serpent or the piercing serpent. So the serpent who pierces and we know he got his things into Eve in the garden and to people throughout time. That's who we, who we would be talking about. Now let me give you a few scriptures to back up. Let's go to Psalm 74. Psalm 74, verses 12 through 14. Psalm 74, 12, 70? 74. 74. 74. 74. 10-4. <laughs> Psalm 74, verses 12 through 14. And I read, Yet God is my king from long ago, who performs acts of salvation in the midst of the earth. You divided the sea by your strength. You broke the heads of the sea monsters in the waters. You crushed the heads of Leviathan. 
You gave him as food for the creatures of the wilderness. This is a crushing blow. This would be a death blow. We don't see it in its totality, but we see Satan as well on his way to that being his reality. I already say a hallelujah even at this stage, but a bigger hallelujah at the final stage. Let me take you to Yeshia, Isaiah 26. Isaiah chapter 26. We'll pick up in verse 21 and we'll go into chapter 27, just the first verse. Isaiah 26 and the last verse, verse 21. For behold, anybody remember? Behold, behold. Yeah. hello, don't miss it. The Lord is about to come from his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their wrongdoing. And the earth will reveal her bloodshed and will no longer cover her slain. I see this at the Battle of Armageddon when the blood flows as high as the horse's bridles. On that day, verse uh, chapter 27, verse 1, on that day, the Lord will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent, with his fierce and great and mighty sword, even Leviathan, the twisted serpent, and he will kill the dragon who lives in the sea. So even though we say sea monster, you can say sea dragon if you want. We see he's going to be put to death eventually. Right now he is being bound, he's being overthrown, he's being chained. He, he no longer will be able to spread his venom to anyone or anything. In his neck there's a bright star that's called Mira, M-I-R-A, and it means the rebel. And that fits him well. That's what he is. He was a rebel from the get-go. When he was lifted up in that pride, he was rebelling against God. So he is a rebel. We'll say more about that in just a moment. What I'd like you to notice is Cephas is right there. At his neck area also, you see the band. Remember the band tied the fishies together, the two fishes. So we're looking right at that area. That band that's uniting the fishes is fastened onto the neck of the monster, holding him firmly bound. That's the idea there, is that he is just as bound. Who is doing that? The one who is doing that, notice right there in that picture, is Ares. Ares has his foot over the band that is bound to the neck that's binding the sea monster. So we're seeing that he's, he's being controlled by the ram. He's being controlled by the lamb. We know that's a picture of Yeshua Jesus. He goes down in defeat because of Yeshua Jesus. He is not Yeshua's equal opposite. He is less powerful. He is less than, and he goes down in defeat. At this point, the mirror star is interesting, will disappear periodically seven times in six years. Comes and goes, comes and goes, comes and goes. It'll look bright, then it'll look dim. Then it'll look bright, then it will look dim. It appears to be very unsteady. And I believe that's showing the diminishing of Satan. His power is diminishing, and he eventually will disappear altogether. We will see that in time coming. We don't see it in the sea monster, but we will see it when we deal with the dragon. So hang tight. We will see his defeat. Okay? So that is Cetus, the sea monster, the enemy of God and of his people. And uh, the next one that we want to look at is Persuius. And I'm sure I'm slaughtering these names. I'm going to borrow it back for a minute. I can't look up another chart. But, uh, okay, and I did this so that I would remember, and now I've forgotten. Um, <laughs> I did it just. Okay. What's the name? Persuius, P E R S E U S. Roger, you've got it up there. Go to the He's next right there, one. Right? He's a, he had the sword. Uh, yes, he would, yeah, because he's the breaker. Where are you seeing him? Right above the bull. Right above the bull. Thank you. I see it. I knew he was close. Okay, so look right above the bull. The sword's up above his head. And Roger's got it up on the big screen now. There we go. Okay, if I remembered the head, I would remember oh, yes. where to find him. Uh, my problem is I, I have to study too many of these at once, and then all of a sudden, uh, oh, where did the matches go? <clears throat> so for those of you color coordinating, this is the third decon under Aries. P-E-R-S-E-U-S. -E -E Pursuus? I don't know. Anyway, oh, my note even told me it was about Aries. <laughs> okay, 59 stars. It comes from the Hebrew root word peretz. Peretz means the breaker. Okay, I've heard of divider also, but I think breaker is a little better for what we're looking at here. He is delivering his redeemed. How did you say breast? 
Uh, no, I said the breaker. Peretz. Peretz, the Hebrew word. P E R E T Z. P E R E T Z. Oh, T Z. Okay, Peretz. Um, very close to Perez, the name that you do here today, but oh, Perez, yes. okay? And that means the breaker, okay? He is going to deliver his redeemed. That's what we're seeing. Remember I told you we're moving into that now. Um, we're seeing still the people that he came back to redeem. That's okay. That's okay. You hit silent. Okay. Micah, Micha, chapter 2. Verses 12 and 13. Micah chapter 2, verse 12. I will certainly assemble all of you, Yaakov, Jacob. That's the name for Israel when he's talking in general. The next phrase says it. I will certainly gather the remnant of Israel. I will put them together like sheep in the fold, like a flock in the midst of its pasture. They will be noisy with people. The sheep are going to be bad. There are going to be a lot of sheep in this fold. The Lord is bringing them together. I love it. It's noisy in heaven too, folks, so I have news for you. And you won't need earplugs. <laughs> Verse 13. The one who breaks through uh, the one who breaks through goes up before them. They break through, pass through the gate, and go out by it. So their king passes on before them and the Lord at their head. What that verse means is the Lord is the one who's breaking through. He is the gatekeeper of the sheepfold, and he has broken through and brought his family, his sheep, his fold. He's bringing them all together. That's what we're seeing in this verse. The, the verse, Micah, 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 is that what you're after? Uh, no. Chapter. Chapter. Chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay, so... The description that we have is that the breaker takes his place before his redeemed, breaking forth at their head. We just read that. Breaking down all the barriers. He's broken down, remember, the heads of Leviathan, of the serpent, and all of his hopes. Now, in the right hand is a great and strong sword. It is lifted up to smite the enemy. Remember when he comes back in Revelation 19, it says that he, you know, he comes out of heaven and he comes with the sword out of his mouth. I don't believe that's a literal sword that he's holding with his teeth, but the word of God is the sword. And the word of God is the word in his mouth. And that's what's coming out. But here it's pictured by a, an actual sword that's lifted up, ready to come down and take out the enemy. And that's he, called the word of God? The sword is the word of God. That's Hebrews, I want to say 4.12. Uh, don't quote me on it, but I want to say that. I can get you the scripture later if you remind me because I can't write a note right now. Okay? Um, he is ready to smite the enemy. He has wings on his feet. A little difficult to see in our picture, but the, the little declaration right, around the feet. It's on his heels. Yeah, it's on his heels, heels his feet, you know, at his feet. The idea of that is he's coming swiftly, very quickly. And once he comes... He's going to come quickly. He's, he'll come out of heaven quickly. His army comes with him. He stops the battle. He sets up this time of peace when the sea monster is bound for a thousand years in the abyss. Okay? In his left hand, he carries the head of the enemy who he has slain. We'll come back to that head in a moment. Okay? Hebrews 4.12 is right. It is right. Thank you. Hebrews 4.12 is right, Loretta. What? The Hebrews 4.12 is the verse you want. Okay. Thank you, Emily. Um, one foot is on the brightest part of the Milky Way. Okay, I love this. This is where our stars come alive and they dance for us. When Perseus comes to the meridian, that's the highest point in the sky on the circle between the south and the northern poles. Don't ask me to explain it any better. When I see it in reality, when I'm flying past it, I'll be able to explain it to you. But right now, this is the scientific definition. So, Pursuus comes up on the meridian, comes up on that highest point. It's the most, it's the highest point between the south and the north. When that happens, the most brilliant portion of the starry heavens opens up in an awesome, in a sublime way, in a magnificent way. We're going to talk about some of the brightest stars in the sky that we know. 
there would come up in this when Perseus comes up at this time. Um, he comes up in the Eastern Hemisphere, and it's interesting because we know the Lord comes back, he comes from the East. That's why the temple faces east. That's why we face east when we pray toward Jerusalem also. We're looking to the east. Let me give you the east first, and I'm going to come back to those stars. Um, we're going to Ezekiel. I'm going to come back to those bright stars. I'm going to tell you a few more things that just get me going. <laughs> okay, Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 43, verses 1 and 2. Ezekiel 43, verses 1 and 2. Then he led me to the gate, the gate facing east, and behold, the glory of the God of Israel was coming from the way of the east. His voice was like the sound of many waters, and the earth shone from his glory. This is the time when he's going to come into the millennial temple and fill it with his Shekinah glory. This is a beautiful picture. That temple has never seen the glory the way it will see it then. Even when we go all the way back to the original tabernacle, the Shekinah glory hovered over the ark, ho hovered over um, the mercy seat, you know, the holy holies. But this glory is going to fill the entire temple, and it is a huge temple. So we see the glory of the Lord. You saw how it said that he, he was facing east. He came from the east. Matthew 24. How many of you remember when I said something about the east in relation to this chapter that I've gone through over and over and over with you all? If you don't remember, it's toward the end of chapter 24. Uh, it is about, let's see if we can start, we can just jump in. It's talking about the return of the Lord also. Verse 27 of chapter 24 of Matthew says, For just as the lightning comes from the east, flashes as far as the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. So we have the, the angle that he's coming. We'll see it all the way across the world. But he's coming from the east and it'll shine to the west. Lastly, Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 14. Zechariah chapter 14 and verse 4. Zechariah 14 verse 4 says, On that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in front of Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives will be split in its middle from east to west, forming a very large valley. Half of the mountain will move toward the north, the other half toward the south. What do we have happening? We have a huge place opening up. God's just pushing the mountain. He's split. He's opened up. He's pushing north. He's pushing south. You've got a huge valley east to west, and the temple's going to go right in there. Woo exactly. Woo -hoo. It is going to be glorious. Okay. So that's our background for this um, keep looking at him though because we've still got to talk about that head. But let's go do the star names. Um, that'll take us into the head. Okay. In his waist, there's a star that means who helps. Um, there's also another name given to it, and that name means surround or protect. When I see and think that's in the middle, it makes me think of the girdle when um, the high priest put on the breastplate of righteousness and the girdle of the sash that's tied. We see the sash of gold around the Messiah when he's returning. To me, that's a safe place. It is a protective place. It's a secure place. It's a controlling place. So I see all of that in it. In his right shoulder, the star there means who carries away. He's going to carry away. He's going to carry away his people. Remember, he's putting them in the bowl, and he's going to get rid of the others. In his left foot, it means he who breaks, partly what helps give us, gives us the name the breaker. Now, the head in his hand is called Medusa. From the Hebrew root, it means the trodden underfoot. Okay? When I hear the trodden underfoot, I go right back to that prophecy <coughs> we've probably used 50 times already in our study of the stars. Genesis 3.15. That all Satan would be able to do would be to crush the, his heel where, Messiah's heel where he touched the earth, but Messiah would crush his head, bring him that death blow. So where Jerusalem's trodden underfoot of, of those in the tribulation, now we see the total turnaround because Messiah has returned, he is breaking the, the power of Satan that has trodden the, the, the the righteous of the Lord underfoot. Now we see under his foot what is trodden. And who would that be? Our sea monster. That would be uh, Cetus trodden under the foot. That's Satan, basically. Okay? I'm still going to come back 
uh, well, let me do the the head right now. Then I'll I'll go on with what happens with Satan. The um, okay. So the the star in the head, that name is in the Hebrew. They call it Rosh Satan, the head of the adversary, the head of Satan. Okay, in the head that's being held in his hand. Okay. Um, there's also a head star called Al Gal. Now that probably is short for Goliath. If you don't know that name in Hebrew, you know it in English. Goliath. Okay, the head of Goliath. It means denuded exile. If you're denuded, you've lost everything. If you strip a land, you've denuded the land, you've taken out the trees, everything is just, there's nothing. Satan is denuded. He has nothing left. Everything has been stripped from him. Now here's where it gets interesting. The star where, where in, in his head is the same place when David, Leo David, took the rock and rocked the giant to sleep. Remember it, it hit him in like the forehead? That's the place where this star is. So I think it's alluding to Leo David up against Goliath. Yes, now the, the son of David, who is also the Lord of David, has taken out the enemy, and he's taken him out with a death blow to the head. Um, it, it's just it's very interesting to me. Do you remember what David did? <laughs> I don't want to gross any of you out, <laughs> but if you remember, after he so he rocked him to sleep, and just said it, he ran up to Goliath, who's dead on the ground. He cut off his head with the sword. And then he picked that head up, and he put it in a bag, and he carried it around. And he chased everybody in a second. <laughs> and, Gross. you know, I think, I heard somebody else say it, and it just resonated with me. I just see him kind of going, I did it, look what happened. He's dead, he's dead. You know, anything that's lost its head is dead. It's not going to come back to life. It wasn't a sleeping giant, and all of a sudden he's going to wake up. It's not that it's suddenly going to turn into a nightmare. It's death. Well, what I see here, I see our Lord has cut off the head of our enemy. He is done. He is bagged up. He is going to be gone and forgotten. It is done. It is over. I love it for that reason. A little bit gross if you picture it in your mind too much. So we'll move on from that. Um, Greek mythology calls this the head calls it Medusa, and if you remember, Medusa was a demonic goddess. She had serpents for her hair. Yeah. So it's yeah. Ooh, serpents, serpents for her hair. I saw a movie on that. Did you? Okay, yeah. 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 She's defeated. The giant's defeated. The serpent from Eden is defeated. The Hebrew name of this severed head, they call it Ha Satan, or Al Ghul in the Arabic. Either way, you can hear the ghoulish sound. Satan is dead. Dead, 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 dead. Hallelujah. You can pray for me. He's not going to like me. <laughs> I don't right. care. And I don't care. Okay, now. Um, okay, I told you all of that. Also, that, that Al Ghul, that uh, Hasatan star, it's a variable or a changing star. Again, it's another one that will be bright, dim, bright, dim. Again, Satan is not full of power. He's not the greater power. He is diminishing, and he will finally, his light will go out. I'll put it that way. Um, this speaks of our enemy. Our enemy has transformed himself to deceive, to devour, to destroy. We see him as a roaring lion. That's 1 Peter, 1 Kepha, chapter 5 and verse 8. Satan is referred to as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. We see him as the subtle serpent in the garden. Read what Genesis verse? 3, 1 Peter 5, 8. Genesis 3, 1 is where we see him subtle. He deceives Eve. We see him even called an angel of light in 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. Beware of your enemy. He comes camouflaged. He comes sneaky. He comes roaring. He comes in all ways, but his power, I'm sorry? He comes bearing gifts also. Yes, he'll even come bearing gifts, and you do not want those gifts, trust me. What book is it again? Uh, okay. 2 Corinthians 11, 14 is where he's called an angel of light. Remember, God made him beautiful. 
It was his own pride that got caught up in him and yeah. changed him. But that power also is variable. It will go from strong to weak to completely non-powerful, um, completely at that time. Um, now, this is, again, I try to take something very technical and bring it down to us. Comets are very interesting. We're all familiar with Haley's Comet. Mm -hmm. We know it comes and it goes, and I think it's 76 years, if I remember correctly. Yeah. But most comets, this was new to me, most comets, com, comets, C-O-M-E-T, okay? Most comets only come into relation of Earth once during the human lifespan. They're thousands of years apart when, when they come. They're not common like Halley's Comet is. It just happens that there are two comets that, um, okay, the way this says it is, it says a comet typically passes by the Earth once within the period of human records. So we've got records for thousands of years. Most of the comets that we have, it was once. They, because of the... the if they're um, steady, we can know, like Halley's, when it's going to be back. So they knew that, the, that this one comet was coming. And this was in the 90s. I don't know why in the 90s, but it did happen in, in I think it was 1996 and 97 or 95 and 96. This one comet came, and it went through the head, and it either was the one that went this way or it's the one I'm going to tell you about that went this way. But anyway, between these two comets that were only a year apart, that neither one will show up for thousands of years again, they crossed wow. right where the the um, <laughs> star that, that says, the you know, that, that, that head, that death blow, right there. They formed a cross in the, the path that they take because they're on their own paths. They formed a cross, and where that cross intersects is right there in, in the forehead, of uh, this one who is a picture of Satan being dead. Do you have the name of that, those two? Uh, I can look it back up. Um, I don't have, I didn't think to write it down, their technical names, but yeah, That's I can okay. get it for you. Um, I want to say one is something like H-A-L-E, Hale Boop, <laughs> B-O-O-P. <laughs> That's popping out my mind if I'm remembering accurately, and I don't remember the other one, but I know right where to go because I just learned that last night. See, I review for class, even though I've studied ahead. Mm -hmm. I'm never content. I'm always looking for more, and I came across that lesson. I went, wow, just in time to wow, add that yeah, in, Lord, thank you. So it's just there, fascinating. So wasn't there a religious cult when Haley's Comet came that had a mass suicide in time with when it passed by because they were going to ride Haley's Comet, yeah, the yeah. tail to heaven? They drank the poison. Um, a lot like Jim Jones. A but. lot like Jim Jones. I remember it also. <clears throat> I remember <throat> the bad jokes that went around. They, 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 in essence, committed suicide. They expected to be going on this this comet, like she's saying. It was their pathway, you know, out. But uh, their ride to heaven on the table. But they took their coming. lives. Sadly. Well, part of it, but I didn't understand all of it. Yeah. It. It just. It's, it's a cult. Right? It's a cult, and it, Satan's their leader, and the same way Satan tells the enemy of Israel today, if you kill yourself and, you know, the more you blow up, the greater reward will be yours in heaven. Nice. Basic is 72 virgins as soon as you get to heaven. And where did they wake up? <laughs> in the flames of hell. <laughs> so he's a horrible, horrible taskmaster. There's horrible. No <laughs> hell, there's a virgins. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, that ends chapter four of the second book. That ends our fourth, you know, we've done our four major constellations and the smaller ones that were underneath. So we're now ready to go into that third book. That's like if, when I gave you that outline today, that would be ABC. First book, first coming, Messiah in suffering. Second book, the redeemed, the people he suffered for. The third book, is Messiah coming, or Redeemer coming in his glory, his second coming, coming, um, well, I, I, I don't want to say for the Redeemer, because we've got the Redeemer book too. I'll just leave it at that. He, if this is the Redeemer, his second coming. Chapter 1 is going to talk about Messiah, the coming judge of all the earth. So we've opened that third book. We're going to see four chapters in that third book. Each chapter is going to be one of our constellations. The first one is Taurus. 
in Hebrew is Re'im. Taurus is the sign of the bull. It's right there behind Aries. It's, he looks like he's you know, pawing at the dirt and his horns are ready to gore somebody uh, because he's coming as a judge. He is coming as judge of all the earth. Now, this is not a little bull. I don't mean that that other way either. But it's not bull either. I'm it's sorry. A big bull, if you it? didn't get that, we'll, that just let go over your head. Okay. Um, what I want to get to your attention is <laughs> this would be a bull that's about the size of an elephant. This is a 2,000 pound bull coming. This is not a little nice bull that's, you know, this, this is a bull rushing forward with mighty energy, with Fierce wrath, his horns are set to push his enemies, to pierce them through, to destroy them. This is Messiah coming to judge. This is not a sweet, you know, oh, let me, you know, let me just bring everybody in. No, he's cleaning house. He's, he's taking out the enemy. This is the Lord coming as the prophecies of Messiah being fulfilled where he's coming as judge where he is coming as ruler, where he is coming to be Lord of all the earth. I've got a number of scriptures to back this up and show you. Let's start in Isaiah. Yeshia, Isaiah chapter 13, and we'll, go to, we'll start at verse 6. Isaiah 13, <clears throat> verse 6. Uh, we're going to read 6, then we'll drop down to 9 through 11. Isaiah 13, 6. Wail, cry, that kind of wail, not a wail in the sea, W-A-I-L. Wail, for the day of the Lord is near. It will come as destruction from the Almighty. You know, I'm just going to pause because when I read many, many verses like this, when you tie this in with his coming at the battle of Armageddon, okay? Battle, blood, war. This is not a pretty picture. I really do not understand the teaching that goes out there that Messiah is coming back to a prepared land for him is all ready and he sits down on his throne. Now he comes back as this bolt. He comes back warring, putting an end to all of the gore and all of this horrible picture. And then he sets up his kingdom of peace, bringing into the start of it those that he's brought through the tribulation Somehow they managed to not be martyred, but they had put their faith in the Lord, and they are the ones who will enter into the millennial reign because they've been living on earth. They've not been killed. They've not gone into heaven because they never left this earth. They're the ones that will go in and start the millennial time. This is Matthew 25 where he, he casts out the, the ones who were not uh, believers in him and the ones who were, the sheep and goat judgment. The sheep go in and the goats get get knocked out, okay? There's, it's not a pretty picture just prior to this. It's a beautiful picture after he's done it for the thousand years of peace. But it's not beautiful, you know, it's, it's not the age of Aquarius. It's not any of this that everything's, you know, if it was, God help us. We're moving in the wrong direction. We are not gaining. We are losing. And I'm sorry to say that, but we are. The evilness of this world is getting worse, but that's what God prophesied, and that's what we'll see in the tribulation. So, the bull is bad. The bull is bad? No, the bull is, is the Messiah so coming. He's coming to, to judge. He's coming to take out the enemy. And that's he, after the uh, Armageddon, right? Or right at the end. He ends <coughs> yeah. Armageddon. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we're in Revelation 19. Okay? We just read verse 6 of Isaiah 13. We're dropping down to verse 9. Behold, the day of the Lord is coming, cruel, with fury and burning anger, to make the land of desolation. He will exterminate its sinners from it. See, he's going to clean house, folks. He's coming to judge. He's coming to cast out all of that enemy that has bowed to the Antichrist, that is worshiping the Antichrist, that has taken his mark, that thinks that, that they've got it all. They're the ones that are going to lose. They're the, the sinners that will be cast out. Verse 10, interesting. Keep it in context, but interesting. For the stars of heaven and their constellations will not flash their light, the sun will be dark when it rises, and the moon will not shed its light. We see a change even in the stars of the heavens. Not that it changes the story, but we know that even the stars are going to be reflecting what's going on down on earth. Remember how we saw the night sky at the crucifixion, and what was seen was Aries, the stars that show the wounded, um, 
and, and all those other meanings, the pierce, you know, all of that. Now we're seeing that I believe that the stars that have done their story even are some of the ones that will be falling out of the heavens. And we're seeing, maybe seeing the bull, seeing him come. But even, even there, they're not going to be uh, the bright lights and the enjoyable that they are now. The sun's not going to give light to the people. The moon's not going to be giving its, its light at night. We know that there's a period of great darkness during the tribulation. So dark that men will gnaw their tongues in agony over that darkness. It, again, it's, it's a horrible picture, but the Lord is bringing that to an end. And that's what we are seeing. He is the bull. He is coming to judge. And, and rightfully so, he is a righteous judge. He's not coming and just take out whosoever. He's taking out the enemy. He's, he's cleaning what needs to be cleaned out. Go to chapter 34 of Isaiah. <clears throat> chapter 34. And we'll look at verses 2 and 8. Verse 2, chapter 34, Isaiah. For the Lord's anger is against all the nations and his wrath against all their armies. He has utterly destroyed them. He has turned them over to slaughter. Remember, all the nations have come up against Israel. They've come what up to do it? battle. That was verse 2 of chapter 34. That's why the Lord's anger is at the nations. These are the unsaved coming to do harm to his, to his land and his people. Verse 8 of chapter 34, just dropping down. For the Lord has a day of vengeance. He is going to come in vengeance. A year of retribution for the cause of Zion. He's seen all the injustice that's been done to Israel. He has seen the injustice that's been done to his righteous remnant made up of both Jews and Gentiles. He's going to come against that. He is going to stop the enemy from being able to do any more devastation to his people. Chapter 42 in Isaiah. Chapter 42, and we are looking at verses 13 and 14. Whoops. And we read, The Lord will go out like a warrior. He will stir his zeal like a man of war. He will shout. Indeed, he will raise a war cry. He will prevail against his enemies. <clears throat> Verse 14, I've kept silent for a long time. <clears throat> I have kept silent and restrained myself. That's God speaking. Now like a woman in labor, I will groan. I will both gasp and pant. He, he, he's been long-suffering. He waited for that cup of wrath to get full. It's been poured out. They're still turning against him, and now it is on. The baby comes, <laughs> okay? 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians. Thessalonians chapter 1. And we'll look at verses 7 through 9. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 through 9. To give relief to you who are afflicted along with us. Paul's being the us. Paul's the one speaking, writing to those in Thessaloniki. And he is saying, you've been afflicted. God's going to write that now. He's going to bring justice. When is he going to do that? When the Lord Jesus, when Adonai Yeshua will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire. Don't forget that. We may get that far today. That will mean something. In flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God, to those who do not obey the gospel of our Adonai Yeshua, of our Lord Jesus. If we need to close that, because no, listen. Okay. okay. Is it too warm? No. Okay. All right, then we'll go on. Okay, it's just getting warm here because the fire's coming. Okay, a little warm. A little bit warm. Okay, I'm gonna. Too warm. Okay, I will bring it down and I will talk loud, Roger, so that hopefully the recording will be okay. Um, Dory, you have a question? Oh no, I was gonna say she warm. Oh, she warm. <laughs> okay. It feels a little stuffy to me, but I'm teaching, so I can't judge. She warm. Okay, I'll just stay loud. Hopefully the recording will be good. Pray me back on mic and we won't have any problem. We'll let y'all this summer have a cool house and we'll be able to carry on. Sean. Revelation 6. Sean. Yes. Take the recorder, put it in front of you by your tablet. Okay. Where does that go? Okay. Revelation 6, verse 12 through 17. Revelation 6, the beginning of the tribulation, but yet it's looking far 
it goes to the sixth seal. I looked when he broke the sixth seal. There was a great earthquake. The sun became as black as sackcloth, made a hair. The whole moon became like blood. The stars of the sky fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its unripe figs when shaken by a great wind. The sky was split apart like a scroll when it's rolled up. Every mountain and island was removed from its place. Do you see world catastrophe, heaven catastrophe? I mean, everything is shaken from this. Then the kings of the earth and the eminent people and the commanders and the wealthy and the strong and every slave and every free person hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They're scared to death. They're running to hide. You ever seen those King Kong movies, you know, the big, you know, and they're running? Well, that's a, kind of a, a picture of what it's like. They even said to the mountains, the rocks fall and hide us from the sight of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of the wrath is coming. Who is able to stand? This is what we're talking about. And the only ones who will be able to stand are the ones that are on the side of the bowl, who's coming in righteous judgment. Okay? Okay, I thought I saw a question, I guess not. Okay, all right, the Hebrew name is Shur. It's from the root, and that's S-H-U-R. Okay, it's from the root, which means both coming and ruling. So the Hebrew name for, for this, Re'im, is the name for the bowl. But um, the Hebrew, when we go back into the root, we come to the word Shur, and it means coming and ruling. There is a bright star in the bull's eye. Um, it's... It means the leader or the governor, okay? So the head, in essence. The star at the tip of the left horn means wounded or slain. So that, when we put that together, we have this one who's coming to rule, who is the governor, who is the leader, who is the head, is one who has been wounded. Do you see how we're seeing Messiah is the same? That the one who came the first time and suffered is the one who comes the second time. When we're sharing our faith with our Jewish friends, we bring scriptures to them, messianic scriptures, that show both a suffering servant and a reigning king. And we bring them to say, now either we've got two messiahs, or we have one who comes twice. And of course, that's the answer. We have the one who comes twice. There's a cluster of stars in his neck. You all are gonna know this name. That's the Pleiades. The cluster in the neck of the bowl is, a, is all Pleiades. Pleiades is a number of stars. It's not a constellation, but it's an integral part of Taurus. Taurus is huge. Okay, in that cluster, there's um, the meaning that comes out of some of those names is the congregation of the judge or the ruler. So the bull who's coming to rule and reign has his own congregation. Who's that? He's the bull. Who's his congregation? Us. us. Thank you. Get all excited. Us. That's us. We're, we're represented by the Pleiades. That's us. I think that's pretty cool. Okay? Um, it, it, the Hebrew can also mean the heap or the accumulation. What I just see is that it keeps accumulating more and more. More and more are coming in. And he's got this whole accumulation. Remember Revelation 19, 14, when he comes back as bull, he comes back to annihilate the enemy, to rule and to reign. Who comes with him? The armies of heaven. Who's that? Us. Us. Say it again, Dora, say it loud. Us, the believers. believers. Yay. We're being seen in this. The children of God. <laughs> the children of God, the believers. Yes. When it says he comes with his saints. Yes. Okay, now... Um, there's seven stars in the Pleiades, I understand, major stars, you know, in that. Some compare that to the seven plagues of the book of Revelation. But I like better because remember the churches, it talks about the star in the hand, you know, the, the churches being represented, and we have seven <coughs> churches. So I, I like to look at it as that. The seven stars in Pleiades are the seven churches. We are the, the his called out assembly that will come back to roll and write with him. I just think it's cool. I'm getting all excited because we're into the best part now. We, we're into this coming back to roll and write, and I can hardly wait. I, 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 I'm not alone, I'm sure. Okay, let me show you that we do have this name in scripture. We're going to go to Job. Job, Job is at least the time of Abraham, if not a little sooner. Oh, okay, I did it wrong. My tablet brought it wrong. Okay, 
in Job chapter 9 and verse 9, it's talking about what all that God has made. Okay? He puts a seal on the stars in verse 7. He stretches out the heavens, and we've seen how he's stretching out the heavens and telling us his story. Then verse 9 says he makes the bear, Orion, who we'll talk about soon, and the Pleiades. There's our name. That name goes all the way back in Scripture here. And then it says, and the constellations of the south. So when we've looked at the constellations down in the south, it's the, our Bible is referring to them. Go to Job chapter 38 also. Job chapter 38. Nine? Chapter 9, verse 9. Okay. 9, 9. This is 38, 31, and 32. Chapter 38, verses 31 and 32. This is when God is, is basically humbling Job, Job and saying, you know, who's got the power? He says to him, can you tie up the chains of the Pleiades or untie the cords of Orion? Can you bring out a constellation in its season and guide the bear with her satellites? We're going to talk on about Orion. We're going to talk about another constellation. We'll, I, we talk about the bear by a different name, but it's just very interesting. Here's proof that this goes all the way back in time in our scripture, just because you know we've talked about how do we know? Well, here's some that we can actually know. Job chapter 42, verses 13 and 14. Okay, I have no idea. Uh, that's not what I wanted, sorry. Oh, I looked in the wrong place. I went back up to my Isaiah note. I'm done with Job. Sorry. Go to Amos. 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 A-M-O-S. Amos in, in Hebrew. Amos chapter 5, your favorite book. Cool. It's like Revelation. It is a lot like Revelation, yes. Because it's telling a lot of what's going to happen prophetically. There we go. My tablet finally took it. Amos chapter 5 and verse 8 says, He who made the Pleiades and Orion changes deep darkness in the morning who also darkens day in the night who calls for the waters of the sea pours them out on the surface of the earth the lord is his name hallelujah he is the one who created he is the one who made he is the one who is in control and he is the one who will fulfill he is going to come back like the bull and he is going to judge when amos is uh, when we're there in chapter five it is connected with judgment he does come to judge. Again, this is not our, our common, tame, quote, bull of today. This is the wild bull from primeval ages, fierce and mighty, the symbol of the Messiah as, I'll say it, he's an angry judge. Now that's righteous anger. He's judging sin. He's judging evil. He's calling it to an end. Uh, did we do Isaiah 13, 11 to 15? We did Isaiah 13 up to verse 11. I guess we should have gone on a little further. Let's take it a little further. We'll go back to Isaiah 13. And we're going to look at verses 13 through 15. Let's go 11 through 15. Let's pick it back up where we left off. Chapter, um, what did I say? What chapter? 13. 13, thank you. Verse 11. So I will punish the world for his evil and the wicked for their wrongdoing. I will also put an end to the audacity of the proud, humiliate the arrogance of the tyrants. I will make mortal man scarcer than pure gold and mankind than the gold of Ophir. Therefore, I will make the heavens tremble and the earth will be shaken from its place at the fury of the Lord of armies in the day of his burning anger. It will be that like a hunted gazelle or like a sheep with no one to gather them, each of them will turn to his own people, each of them will flee to his own land. Anyone who is found will be thrust through, and anyone who is captured will fall by the sword. Do you see the power? The one who made it all. He's going to cause the earth to tremble, the heavens to shake, and he is going to come with the power that takes out Cetus, the sea monster. It's going to take out Draco, the dragon. It's going to take out the scorpion. Remember, he's the enemy. And it's very interesting that when Taurus rises, scorpion sets. Scorpio sets, okay? So the one who we saw was the enemy of the Lord. We saw him as evil like we saw the sea monster. He's going to set in the sky below the, um, oh, what do they call it? where he can't be seen, goes off where he can't be seen as Taurus the bull rises. 
very, very interesting. Now, it's also interesting that um, Re'im in Hebrew now is the name for bull. In scripture, it was a wild ox, usually called that. You might even see unicorn in your translations, depending on what translation you use. Let me take you to Numbers. The Midbar in our Hebrew, Numbers in our English, Numbers 23, and we're going to look at verse 22. Numbers 23, verse 22. God brings them out of Egypt. That's when he's talking about bringing the children of Israel out of captivity in Egypt. He is for them like the horns of the wild ox. That's the same word that we're using for the bull here. So it's just interesting that when he talked about how he rescued Israel out of Egypt, he uses the same analogy. He's going to rescue his redeemed out of the clutches of Satan, the enemy, at this point. Look at chapter 24 of Numbers and verse 8. Just go over one chapter and go to verse 8. Numbers 24 and verse 8. Again, God brings them out of Egypt. He is for him like the horns of the wild ox. He will devour the nations who are his adversaries and will crush their bones and smash them with his arrows. That's a full defeat of the enemy. Now, there is a carving in a cave in Italy. Some want to say it even predates the flood. I don't know, but I do know they found fossils that you know were preserved because of the flood. Anyway, when this carving when they determined from everything else around it, shows a bull nine feet tall. This, this is what I'm trying to say. This, this is the elephant size. This is the bull. But in scripture, the bull is also a sacrificial animal. So this one who is coming back as a judge is coming to judge on the basis of his sacrifice. If you're in the blood that the bull represented, the blood of Yeshua, you're not slain by the bull coming. You will be part of that Pleiades that, that's coming back with him. <coughs> that even in his judging, he judges on the basis of his sacrificial blood. Anyone can receive that blood. No one has to receive the wrath of the bull. Interesting. That's why he went to the cross for us, right? Exactly. That's why he went to the cross for us. Exactly. And he's showing his mercy right there in the midst of this judgment. If that judgment's coming down harsh on them and they want to holler, wait a minute, I don't deserve this, he will say, I even shed my blood. I even was a sacrifice for you, but you rejected me. So no one ends up in hell apart from their own doing it to themselves. You know, it's not who God intended hell for, that was made for the devil and his angels, but those who choose to reject, who do not want to be one with the Lord, who do not want to be in his presence, who do not want to accept him, they are the ones who then are choosing to receive the wrath of the bull and to be put into an eternity away from the one they didn't want to be with. Need I say more? Well, remember we mentioned Orion and Job? And you know, guess what the first decon under Taurus the Bull is? Orion. So we're going to look for Orion on our map. So I, I give you the map, I'm going to take it back, thank you. And again, my mind is gone, so one of us can find him quickly, Orion. He's right next to the yeah. bottom of the yeah. bull to the left. Yeah. I have my hand right on right away, too. You looked at um, Pursuus, however you're supposed to say that one, Peretz in Hebrew, I like my Hebrew better, and you'd look just to the left on your map, and you're going to see, right you're going to see um, Orion. Now, actually, I like him better on the screen because it's easier to see some of the details that I'll be talking about, so you might want to look to the screen. Is he the one with the head on the head? Yes, yes, it's a head of a lion. Okay, did I do, I think I did. Let me just check real quick, make sure I didn't forget to give you a note. Okay, I got another cycle coming. It's exciting that we may not get there today. Okay, Orion has 78 stars. The Hebrew word hezel means a strong one, a hero. It's a giant, even though he doesn't look giant there. This is the glorious one. It is light breaking forth. 
in the Redeemer. And as soon as I say that, okay, this is where I'm going to, I told you I talked about the stars, and remember the glory? That part's still coming. I have not forgotten, but it comes under Orion. I was thinking all of a sudden I forgot to tell you it because it gets, it gets some exciting things in there, but it's coming. It's coming very shortly. So, again, the Hebrew word for Orion means a strong one, a hero, a giant, the glorious one. It's the idea of light breaking forth in the Redeemer, that he's coming back in, in glory. He's coming back in light. Uh, I think I've said it. Okay, we'll get a little bit more of that when we look at the names of the stars. Um, this is the figure of a giant hunter. He has a mighty club in his hand. That's his right hand. He's in the act of striking. Okay? In his left is the skin of a slain lion. He has become victor already. I think of little David even being able to take out lions. You know, we know that power, but that this is the greater one. The Ryan, this is our hero. This is our glorious one. And he's got the... the, the skin of the slain lion the club shows that power okay the coming one that this is representing he is not just an animal he's not just mere man he is the triumphant he is the mighty he is the glorious prince that is coming isaiah yeshia isaiah chapter 42 isaiah 42 Isaiah 42, verse 13. I think we read earlier. Yeah, yeah. 13 okay. and 14. 13 and 14. Okay. We, we, what we want is to focus on this part here. The Lord will go out like a warrior. He will <coughs> stir his zeal like a man of war. He will shout indeed. He will raise a war cry. He will prevail against his enemies. This is the one who is coming. Now, in his left foot, Orion's left foot, the left foot's in the act of crushing. There you go. Oh, good, Roger. <laughs> okay. That left foot is crushing. We haven't talked about yet, but you see Lepus right below? Lepus, that's supposed to be a wild hare. H-A-R-E, rabbit, you know, wild hare. There are other um, animals given to it, but we'll just call them that for right now. Orion is bringing his left foot down. Remember the enemies under your foot? He is crushing Lepus. He wears a brilliant starry girdle to which it hangs a mighty sword. A little bit hard to see in there, but that's, yeah, there we go. The, the belt and the sword, okay? The belt or the handle of which is the head and the body of a lamb, okay? What it's trying to show there in his belt is it's trying to show that he was the slain lamb. Now he's coming as the mighty warrior. Okay, I don't even see the lamb well in there. I had trouble seeing it myself. This is where we'll just go with what we are told. His weapon of victory, he is the, the hunter coming to judge. We read of that in Jeremiah 16, 16 to 18. Jeremiah 16, 16 to 18. Where we read in verse 16, this Behold. Is the snake. Is this foot on the snake? Uh, no, it's on uh, er Eridanus, er Eridanus, that word. Roger just went by. He, it, look like a tube. it looks more like a tube, and we're going to talk about it. I think we get to that. Um, yeah, that's our, our next. We're in Orion. Then we're going to talk about Eridanus, E-R-I-D as in David, A-N as in Nancy, U-S. We're going to talk about that. That's like a tube is a better way to put it. It's, it's a river, but it's being channeled. I'll put it that way. And then our third one's going to be Auriga, the shepherd. Those are the three we're going to look at. So we'll get to Aradnus in just a moment, but right now it's Orion crushing Lepus. So that's it's, a river? Yeah, but it's you'll get that when we get there. We're not quite there yet. We'll be there as soon as I finish Orion. But I got some good stuff in Orion's first. In verse 16 of Jeremiah 16, Behold, I'm going to send for many fishermen, declares the Lord. They will fish for them. Afterward, I will send many hunters. They will hunt them from every mountain, every hill, and from the clefts of the rocks. For my eyes are on the way, their ways. They are not hidden from my face, nor is a wrongdoing concealed from my eyes. So he's coming or, or sending others to hunt, to hunt out those who've done wrong to, 
so for them to get the judgment they deserve as what, well as the victim. Jeremiah 16, verses 16 and 18. Oh, 16, 16. Yes, 16, 16. Through verse 18. Okay, now, here comes some fun. See on the map on, on this side, the right, if you're looking my way, left, if you're looking the other way. The name of the star on the left side. <clears throat> okay, I just said it wrong. It's in his right shoulder because you got to look where he is. He's like here. The star that's here in his right shoulder is Betelgeuse. <laughs> Betelgeuse is one of the brightest stars. Now, I know there's a movie out there. Forget your movie. Just go and live. And if you don't know about Betelgeuse in the sky, let me enlighten you and I say that on purpose because of how bright this star is by the way it means the branch coming we know that Messiah name for Messiah is Samach the branch and we know that well let's go ahead real quick and then I'll tell you about Beetlejuice let's read Malachi Malachi chapter 3 and verse 2 Malachi chapter 3 and verse 2 we're going to come back to Malachi in very short time because we're going to talk about that fire that's coming up but in verse 2, is that verse 2 I want right now? What I just said is 2. Malachi 3. But who can endure the day that's coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and a launderer's soap. Okay, fire, is, this is bright. This is not dull. I thought I had a different, um, actually, I know what I wanted. Maybe it's Malachi 4. I think it's 4. Yes, <clears throat> okay. Chapter four and verse two, keep three also, because that was good, but four and verse two, it's also talking about the day that is coming, burning like a furnace, which is gonna tie in with the radness that we're gonna talk about shortly. But verse two, for you who fear my name, the son of righteousness will rise with healing in his wings. We talked about that earlier, but again, the sun is bright, the sun is light. This is the idea that I want to give you because even uh, in the Hebrew root words, we're seeing the meaning as light or the coming forth of, of the light. Remember, I already told you this is the light breaking forth. We know that the Messiah is the light of the world. We know that he is the bright light, the shining light, all of this. Okay, keep all that in mind. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Betelgeuse, who is in this constellation. It is the eighth brightest star in the night sky. It's the second brightest star that makes up the constellation of Orion. The star's diameter is roughly 2,000 times of our sun. Okay? Wow. 2,000 times. And it's 155,000 times that of Earth. I can't wrap my mind around that. I'm too used to putting a little star in my drawings. This is huge, people. This is huge. It's one of the largest stars known. In the millimeter continuum, the star is around 1,400 times larger than our sun. If you overlaid and you, you took this star into our, our solar system where we could see it in comparison to the others, the planets and all of that, Betelgeuse is so large, it would engulf. That means it would swallow up Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. That's almost half of our planets. If you don't count Pluto as a planet anymore, it is half of our planets because we're down to eight, and that's It would even swallow up the gas giant Jupiter. Only Saturn would be beyond its surface. That's how big it is. That's mind-blowing. That, that, that's just absolutely mind-blowing. Remember, it's, it's in Orion, and Orion's in the neck of the bull. That begins to tell me how big my God is. Because if the bull is big enough to absorb Orion, and Orion's big enough to absorb Betelgeuse, just one of the stars, oh my word, I honestly cannot conceptualize how large that is. This is fascinating. Betelgeuse is the star? The name of the star, Betelgeuse. Oh, okay. They just took it, made a movie, and gave it a different meaning, okay? okay. But Betelgeuse is the name. If you want me to spell it, it's B-E-T-E, -E, that's B as in boy, T as in tall, B-E-T-E-L-G-E-U-S-E. -E -E. 
that they pronounce it Beetlejuice. Okay, now tucked within our cozy solar system of planets, of moons, of comets, and more, the sun is a colossal binding ball of burning light. We know that. That's our light. You know, our sun lights this whole planet Earth. It contains 99.86% of the mass in our solar system, our sun does. And it's large enough that we could fit 1.3 million Earths inside our sun. I don't know if you all realize how big our sun is either. 1.3 million Earths could fit into our sun. Pretty big, right? But while the sun might dwarf the Earth, in reality, that's minuscule compared to some of these largest stars that are home in our galaxy called the Milky Way. The massive, the most massive star within 10,000 light years from Earth is the largest star. It's made up of two stars. It's called, and I don't know how to pronounce it, um, and I just lost the name, Eta, E-T-A, okay, Eta Carnae, C-A-R-I-N-A-E. Okay, Eta Carnae is, we, we think it's one star, but it's really made up of two that are so close together that, that they go together, okay? And that's the most massive star within 10,000 light years from the Earth. That star, Eta Carnae, however you say, is 90 times the mass of our sun. And I just told you that 1.3 million Earths could fit in our sun. So again, I'm telling you this because I want to blow your minds. Not because I think you'll understand, but I want you to realize the majesty of our God, the creation that he has done. It also, this Eticare, we'll call it, we'll call it Eticare, we'll call it for short, okay? It shines five million times brighter than our sun. If it were any closer, it would blind us, we wouldn't be able to see. Notice how God made the sun just enough to be bright for us. We don't stare at it. We know it over our eyes, but we take advantage of its light every day. And yet, go past our sun, go 10,000 light years out there, and there's this one, well, it's a two-star uh, system, but it's shining five million times brighter. It will appear blue to the naked eye. I don't know how the naked eye sees out that far, maybe through the telescope, but it'll appear blue just because its temperature is so hot. It is six times hotter than our sun. Now, even larger than Etikara, the star I just described to you, is a star that's 640 light years from the Earth, and that star is Betelgeuse. That's the one we're talking about that's in Orion. So, again, Betelgeuse is the eighth brightest in the night sky, the second brightest that makes up the constellation of Orion. And it alone, they estimate, is 300 times larger than Eta Carinae, which is so massive that it's 90 times the mass of our sun, and so forth and so on. Have I blown your minds? No. Any of you want to teach it better? Do you understand it? Just went right over your head? Well, thankfully, Dora, it went about 10,000 light years over your head, or 640 anyway. We cannot fathom our God. And when you know he created all this, and anyone who has the audacity to say that this world evolved into its being, well, I just want to ask you some basic questions. Where did it get started? How did it happen to become male and female? How did they happen to come together at the right moment to come together to split off to have, because everything takes the male and female from the, the seeds in, in the plant life to the people in the, in the human life, everything. How did that just evolve at the same time in the same <coughs> place to come together, to go boom and keep in order? And if this is true, where is the progression of today, okay? It takes more faith to believe evolution than to believe there is a God who said, I will make, I create, and call it into being. This is our God. This is the, the how majestic, how mighty, how huge. And then when I think he's got all these stars that are adoring him, praising him, worshiping him, the huge, the vast, the colors, the sizes, the designs. 
wow. And yet he looks past all of that to this little, what do I, what do I call it, a puny little earth in comparison? <laughs> and then he looks past that. There's seven billion on this earth. And he can zero through all of that noise, all of that language, all of that whatever, and zero in. Who do I want to pick up? I'm Patty. And say, Patty, you need this. Or Patty, let me do that for you. Mm -hmm. And we think our problems are too big. <laughs> I tell you, I read this, I study this. I tell myself to zip my lips, but I can't because my mouth is dropped open in awe. <laughs> but what have we to worry about? He keeps it all in order, so orderly that those two comets I told you about crossed at that point of where the star took out the head, Satan, to show his coming death. Go figure. Go figure. Is this a faith building study? Oh, it is for me. It is for me. My God is huge. He is brilliant. He is light. He is the bringer of light. He is the light of the world. He is the light come in. He is the branch come in. He is the light of heaven. That's the ancient name for Orion. He's even greater than that, but the ancient name. It's a hallelujah. It's a hallelujah. It is. And now let me remind you. Remember we said when uh, Taurus comes up and the scorpion goes down, when this part of the sky hits the meridian, it has the brightest stars in it. It has Betelgeuse and these other stars. The most brilliant of the constellations, when it, it hits this, are the ones that are opening up in great splendor. It's all the brightest, the biggest, the best, all representing when he comes in second coming in all his glory. All those constellations are standing up to say, hey, look at his splendor. It's even greater than ours. And as the, the habitable world will see that, blows me away also. Again, I see a stop in time at the crucifixion, and we see that the ram slain and the stars, that the name fit it. And now I see him coming back to rule and reign in his glory. And the stars that are singing are the ones that are the most glorious and the most light that are bringing the glory of God to earth. The heavens declare the glory of God. He is coming in great glory. I just quoted Psalm 19 where we started all this study off. But let me take you to Isaiah again. I guess I love Isaiah today. <laughs> Chapter 60, verses 1 through 3. What was that? Isaiah, Yeshia, the prophet Isaiah. Chapter 60, 6, 0, verses 1 through 3. And don't... And this takes on new meaning to me. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. God was speaking this to Israel, that he was bringing his glory to Israel, but we see the, the fuller impact of us spiritually. For behold, darkness will cover the earth, deep darkness of peoples, but the Lord will rise upon you, and his glory will appear upon you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. And I remember there is no sun in the New Jerusalem. The Lord is the lamp of it. He is the light of it. And the New Jerusalem will hover over the earth, bringing light to the earth. Isaiah 60, verses 1 through 3. I did you Psalm 19.1, the heavens declare the glory of God. Let me take you back easily because you're in Isaiah. Just go back to chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 5. Isaiah 40 and verse 5. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all flesh will see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Anyone want to put an amen there? <laughs> I love it. I love it. This is our God, and what he says will happen. Matthew chapter 19 and verse 28. Matthew 19, 28. And yes, for those of you clock watching, I'm very close to winding up because it'll be a good place to stop. Matthew 19 and verse 28. And Yeshua Jesus said to them, 
Yeah, okay. Truly I say to you, you who have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you also will sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Here we go with his glory being brought down. He is, the bull has cleaned it out, but his glory, the light, is going to come. And there will be those who are part with him. Colossians 3 and verse 4. Colossians 3 and verse 4. I don't know about you, but with all the evil that we see going on around us right now, it's so much, so the heaviness, and we know how much worse it's going to get, I can hardly wait to see the vindication of the Lord. I can hardly wait to see this glory come. Colossians 3 verse 4, when Messiah, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. We're going to get a front row seat. And for those of us five feet tall, there ain't going to be no hat in front stopping our view. <laughs> I love it. Okay. Finishing up Orion in his left foot. <coughs> There's a star that means the foot that crushes. And remember, he's crushing Lepus. We're going to see Lepus as a picture of Satan. In his left shoulder is Bellatrix. You see that the name on the right side of my screen. That means quickly coming or swiftly destroying all of this troop. One of the three stars in his belt, that famous belt of Orion, means the wounded one. Another one means dividing as a sacrifice. Would have been divided when they kept the sacrifice. So we, we see again in Orion, we're seeing he was sacrificed, but he's the great one, the giant, the glory, glorious one coming back in victory. His right leg has a star that means bruised. Again, that's all Satan could do was bruise his heel. He's going to brush his head. Other names are the branch, the mighty, the ruler, and the prince. Um, I think I'm going to bring out for you at another time about the prince, so I won't bring that out now, especially because we're close to the end of our time. What I'm wondering is, because the question came up, um, I want to start Aradnus, and that's where we'll end. Uh, we won't get through, we'll pick up back up in Aradnus next next week also, but because you all were questioning, that's the, the part that uh, looks like a snake, <laughs> looks like a tube, what do you call it, Dora? You had a good word for it. Tube, is that what you called it? Okay, okay. It's actually the river of the judge. Now remember the bull, he's coming back to judge. But that's what Aradnus, or however I should be saying it, <coughs> the ancient name means fire flowing forth. So this is a river of wrath. This is a river of wrath breaking forth at his enemies. Remember when he comes back and the sword comes out of his mouth and he annihilates the enemies? That's the idea of what we're seeing here. This is an immense constellation. When Roger gets back, he'll put up new pictures on the, um, on the screen, but he had to step out for a moment. But on your chart that you have, the, the little one that I gave you, you see it very close to the sea monster. It's, it's down there, okay? See this, the sea monster where we started the day. That's Radnus or Erdnus, don't ask me. So the river represents the enemies? It's, it's a river of fire that's river flowing fire. forth from the foot of Orion. Okay, fire. it's a river of fire. Fire judges. When God sends fire, it is judgment. We even know when we stand before him for our rewards, what we did, did in our flesh is burned up. It's the gold, the silver, the precious stone that lasts that we get our rewards from the rest is burned up in fire. We're going to see how fire is judgment. We're gonna, I'm going to go into a number of verses. That's where, where we'll be ending. But I, I want you to see and understand since the question came about it. This is a river of fire that's flowing forth from Orion. It's flowing at the enemies of the bull. It runs in a serpentine course toward the lower regions. It goes down, 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 and finally out of sight. Even the Greek mythology connects it with fire as a river of fire. In vain, the sea monster Cetus that you see down there is trying to stop its flow. Remember, he has a big mouth, but he can't. He can't stop the flow. It's the river from the judge. It's the river of the judge. And it speaks of a final judgment in which the wicked will be cast into a lake of fire. Do you see why it goes down and out? It's the fire that goes and it empties into the lake of fire. So it's a river of fire 
that leads to a lake of fire. Now, I'll give you some verses. Like I said, we may not get through it all the way to the end, but I want you to see the defeat. I want you to see that the Lord is the one who gets that victory. Remember, Orion is a picture of the Lord, the, the glorious one that uh, is victor. Go first with me to Psalm 50, 5 -0. Psalm 50 and verse uh, 3. Psalm 50 and verse 3. May our God come and not keep silent. Fire devours before him, and a storm is violently raging around him. So when he comes, fire's coming first, judging, cleaning it up. Yes, Lord. Would it be like, uh, for instance, you know, like when the volcano erupts, all that, I mean, it destroys that fire. It's a good picture, like a volcano erupting. I even think of the dragons, uh, what do they call them, dinosaurs, you know, that would breathe fire, you know. This, that would be the idea, yes. That it, it's, the fire is coming, is being directed is from the Lord to burn up the enemy. The, the righteous will not be burned by it. That verse was Psalm 50 and verse 3. Let me, let me show you his judgment as fiery. That's Daniel. Daniel, we want to go to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. We're going to read verses 9 to 11. And this is, um, the name given is Ancient of Days. The name Ancient of Days is a name for, for God the Father in, in heaven. Okay? Mm -hmm. Verse 9, chapter 7 of Daniel. I kept looking until thrones were set up, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. He is sitting on his throne. This is a time of judgment. His garment was white as snow. The hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was ablaze with flames. Its wheels were a burning fire. A river of fire was flowing and coming out from before him. Catch Orion, the river of fire coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands were serving him. Myriads upon myriads were standing before him. The court convened and the books were open. When God sets up his throne to judge, it is a fiery throne. It is a fire that will be going out from the throne, and it will be, the result of it will be those who will be cast into the lake of fire forever because they rejected the God of their salvation. They rejected the Lord he himself. Um, I think I probably ought to stop there because I have a whole lot more verses of the judgment We'll go into the names of the meaning of the stars in it. But there was a question raised in Malachi, Malachi that said, in this dreadful day of judgment, who will be able to stand? We're going to see when we get to our next decom, because I don't want to leave you on the downer. I want to take you back to Beetlejuice. We're going to see in that next decom, when we pass up, we're done with the river, we have had Orion, we have had Radnus. Our third one is Auriga, A-U-R-I-G-A, and that is the shepherd and its safety for the redeemed in the day of wrath. Hallelujah. He took our punishment for us. He has saved us. We are eternally saved, and we will see the shepherd in the, the sign that when we, when we look at Auriga, Auriga, however you say it, we will see the good shepherd. We will see the great shepherd. We will see the chief shepherd. In his, in his judgment, which is horrifying, it is so righteous that it is glorifying. I think I can put it that way. At, at the same time, horrifying to those who will be judged. Glorifying. When we're finally able to see those who have, who have rejected our Lord, those who have scoffed at him, those who have trampled him underfoot, when we finally see them go down in flames, when we see Satan, the enemy of our very souls, when we finally see him go down in defeat, oh, I can only imagine the hallelujah that's going oh, yeah. to rise up. <laughs> it's going to be a party. There's good, it's on. <laughs> it's Whoa. on. That's what we're beginning to see. We're moving into the mighty judge, coming to judge. It is a horrible day of judgment, but it's wrath deserved because no one had to be there except by choice of rejecting.
Messiah and Savior. Hallelujah for all of us that I'm looking at around that I know we're going to be in the choirs. We're going to be singing the hallelujahs. We're going to be so glad to see the Lord finally justify the way he should be. Will we see them cast in like a fire? I believe that we will see their judgment at the great white throne that's out in space. I believe so because I believe at time, a time like that, when those books are open and they come up for judgment, when they want to argue against it and say, well, I didn't hear, you didn't give me a chance, and you will say, um, wait a minute, I met you. Remember, I gave you that track. Remember, I told you about this. I believe that we even will be involved to some degree in in their judgment in that way. You know that uh, they'll, they'll be without excuse before the Lord. He will silence their mouths. But I do believe we will see the great white throne judgment take place. We know that the result is they're cast into the lake of fire. We see into the lake of fire when we see uh, Satan finally cast into the lake of fire. This is the end of Revelation 20. The thousand years has ended. He's been released for that little time. And then he's cast in the lake of fire forever. The description there that John saw said where the beast and the false prophet are. That's a thousand years from when they were cast in the lake of fire. And he could see they were still in the lake of fire. That does away with um, the annihilation that, you know, you just burn up and it's over. No. It, a thousand years later, the beast and the false prophet are still in that lake of fire in suffering. I do not believe that we will watch and see and hear their suffering for all of eternity because I just, at least not in our humanness, that would be a horror. That, that would be horrible. I know that none of us are going to see and say, oh, there goes my loved one and cry for their loved one. No, we won't see that person as someone we loved. We will see that one as an enemy of our Lord who we love. So it won't be quite in the same way. Being it's, glad for somebody else's suffering is a sin. Right. I'm not right. sure right. exactly, it's, but it, that's... It's not right. That yeah. would not be a Christian. Yeah. That would not be an attitude that you no. would have in heaven. Except for being glad when Satan gets his well, just yeah, there is that. reward. <laughs> but even still that. But, yeah, and, and really... like happiness for the Lord, for God, that he is... Right. Being is vindicated. Right. It, it will be seen in that side. It will yes. be seen from the glory side, not from the horror side. Yeah. So, yeah, it's it just... Uh, and, and when you're seeing it, you're not who you are sitting here today. You're, you're the redeemed. You're the, you have your new mind, which is the mind of Messiah. Because how can he, he loves each one of those that are being cast, you know. How could he, in his love, it, it, it's, this is where our human is just be for him. But yes, yes. And yet at the for same saying that he's time, but all yeah. those lost souls, that's, yeah, it's gotta sad, make him cry. Sad. But at the same time, the righteous judgment, the righteous side of it side that wants to see the Lord um, brought up, honored, respected, bowed down before, you know, all that he deserves. You know, but, but remember, we're not in any kind of pain. We're not in any kind of agony. So we cannot be seeing something that grieves us in a way like it does today. You know, it's a whole different scene. Can I explain it better? But we'll find out together. <laughs> Any other questions, comments? I think it's been a very interesting class. We've covered a lot. I hope that it's thrilled you when you see how great your God is. I hope it's helped minimize your troubles today because they're nothing to this God. Ruth, if you have a question or comment, Unmute yourself. Roger Halper, please. Open it up for everybody. Um, I should close it in prayer. Um, let me close in prayer real fast while he's unmuting everybody, and then we'll go to questions and comments because I know some need to run. Dosi, I think, already had to go. Emily's out the door. Rhonda needs to go. So real quick, Lord God, creator of it all, mighty and majesty, high and lifted up. Praise you. Hallelujah. Your plan is magnanimous beyond what the scope of our understanding. But Lord, by faith we stand and know and believe, and I just humbly say thank you. Thank you for saving me. 
Thank you that my future is in glory with the glorious one forever and ever. And for any who are hearing this who don't know that, can't say that, Lord, may they open their hearts now. May they give their lives to you who created them to have that relationship with you. May they come to know you as Lord and as Savior, and that they too can be set free. And Lord, we will rejoice when the enemy of our loving Lord is put down forever. Thank you that day is coming, but until then, we thank you he does not have power to overcome us. That greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. We praise you as the bright and morning star, the glorious one who is faithful to keep his word. In your holy name, with thanksgiving, hallelujah, amen, amen. Okay.